Because if we can't talk about this and, and share in the emotion, what is it that we can possibly talk about? That I think in the community I came from, we hold cemeteries and graveyards with our highest respect. And it goes from the death to the ground and beyond. I think the cabins are the essence of Kingsley Plantation. You do really have a sense of people who lived there before, but you want to know who they were. The announcement of the discovery was just amazing, so I'm here to learn more about that as well. What begins to bubble up when the community engages around this issue is a spirit that embraces the environment that is uh, reflective, that is remembering. And by the way, that's an interesting word because if you think about remembering, it remembering, that means to put something back together, to remember. I'm Barbara Goodman. I'm the superintendent of the Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve and Fort Caroline National Memorial. Kingsley Plantation is a site within the Timaquan Preserve. I am just so pleased that you're all here tonight and uh, I want to start out the evening with a huge thank you. I care so much about doing the right thing to care for these resources and to honor the memory of the people that lived and died at Kingsley Plantation. And so I need your help, and that's why you're here tonight. I need to know from all of you and the rest of our community how, how we feel about that, how we feel about the discovery of burials, uh, what it means to us individually, what it means to us as a community, and the only way to find that out is to get in a circle and talk about it. Very often in the Park Service and in the government, we are forced to quickly uh, make a decision and move forward and we will have a public hearing and we'll tell you what we want to do and hope that we've convinced you <laughs> to go along with it. We're not doing that this time. We have the rare opportunity that we have time. We have time to have an evening like this and others to come where we can sit and talk and we can listen and learn. So I thank you for being willing to spend the time to do that. After we made the announcement back in November that we had discovered the burials at Kingsley Plantation, uh, we had a weekend um, activity where we had some of the posters that you see around the room. Uh, we had opportunities for people to reflect and give feedback. And that was our first effort to find out what people thought and felt. Shortly after that, I got a letter. And the letter was from someone who attended that weekend event. They were appalled with us. They were appalled that we had not uh, put a fence around the burials. And we were racist because we had not done that. And had we found white burials, we would have had the fence up. Unfortunately, the letter came anonymously. So I had no opportunity to say, wait, stop, let's talk. Because for my experience, that's just so far from the truth. There was so much more that could be said and shared and um, so, so many things had we had the time to do what we're doing today to talk to each other and to have some understanding. So that really made clear to me even more how important an evening like this is. 
because there's so much opportunity to misunderstand each other. And so tonight we have the opportunity to start that conversation, for many to continue that conversation. And again, I just thank you. We're not making any decisions tonight. Tonight is just about sharing and listening and learning. We stand here today under this impressive oak tree. It's impossible for me to wrap my arms around its girth and it's difficult for me to wrap my mind around what this tree has played a witness to. This tree has seen emancipation, slavery, a war. This tree has seen history. And for that reason, we call it a witness tree. This tree watched over this island as the Kingsleys came to it in 1814. This tree saw the construction of these cabins. And in these cabins, enslaved men, women, and children led their lives. Lives dominated by the fields of cotton that lay beyond and by an intense labor system that exploited their bodies. You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. This discovery of an African burial ground, a ground of enslaved people, helps all of us to better understand where, as a nation, we have been, and now where and how we must go forward. We have the opportunity to learn about how you honor those who lived and died at Kingsley Plantation. Ultimately, your thoughts will inform us on our formal decision-making process, where you'll be invited to comment on potential changes to Kingsley Plantation. But that's not what we're doing today. Today, we're here to listen and to learn. Kingsley Plantation is located on Fort George Island, which is the southernmost of the Sea Island plantations, which extend up to around Georgetown, South Carolina. Zephaniah Kingsley was born in Bristol, England in 1765. He became a prominent merchant. He was a slave trader, however, and that's how he made his early fortunes. By the early 1800s, he decided to move to Spanish Florida and become a plantation owner. He acquired over 32,000 acres of property and hundreds of enslaved African men, women, and children. He purposely came to Spanish Florida because it was a very different system of society here than it was found at that time in the United States. Now in the United States, it was a two-tiered system of society, whites and blacks. And whether you were a slave or a free black person in the North or the South, your civil liberties were severely restricted. That was much different than here in Spanish Florida where free blacks shared virtually the same interests as the white people and civil liberties. And we need only look to Anna Kingsley as an example. Here was not only a woman, but a black woman who shared most of the same rights and civil liberties as white men. When you arrive at Kingsley Plantation, it's there you'll see 27 standing slave cabins, which is quite unusual. The reason they're standing is because they were built out of tabby, which is a crude form of concrete using uh, shell and sand from the island. In 1968, Charles Fairbanks was the first person to ever stick a shovel in a slave cabin to ask questions about those people's lives, and it was done at Kingsley Plantation. So when I arrived in University of Florida 2004, I was very keen to look at the previous work that Fairbanks had done in the collections there at the museum, but also to consider the possibility of going to Kingsley and beginning new research questions that we could explore over a series of summer field schools. And I started that in 2006. We're attempting to fill in some of the, the gaps that we have in the history of these people. After becoming more immersed in the archival literature, the records and references to the 19th century Fort George Island, I became increasingly convinced that I thought I had some idea where the Kingsley-era slave cemetery was located. There are two references that I could find 
in the archival record. One of them is an article from the New Scribner's Monthly Magazine, 1878. And it describes the landscape as it would have been during the Zephaniah and Anna Kingsley era, so 1814 to 1839. And it says that the cemetery is located between the slave quarters and the barn. Well, the slave quarters are still standing and the barn is still standing. And so we have some idea within those parameters where it might have been. We also have a reference from Hannah Rollins, who was the wife of John Rollins. And the Rollinses were from New Hampshire, and they purchased the island in 1869. In around 1903, 1904, it appears that Hannah Rollins was asked to write down her reminiscences, what she remembered of the island when she arrived that first year in 1869. And one of the things she says is that there were no trees between the slave quarters and the main house, except for a large oak tree, under which was still visible a black cemetery. This tree marks the site of the slave graveyard at Kingsley Plantation. How many people are buried here? What were their funeral practices? Only the oak knows for sure. In 2009, we put in a series of test units along uh, Palmetto Avenue in the vicinity of this oak tree. We also put in some auger uh, tests, some auger holes, looking for any subsurface features, and we did not find anything. We went back in 2010, during the 2010 field school, and put in uh, an additional unit on the other side of the road, on the east side of the road, uh, opposite the oak tree. And in fact, we did find a rectilinear uh, stain in the soil that was certainly suggestive of a human burial. From what we know about traditions at Kingsley Plantation and from what previous archaeological investigations have revealed, we can presume that they were buried according to some semblance of their African traditions. Grave markers included a large whelk shell, a sad iron, which is an old iron heated on the stove and used to press clothing, and large iron deposits similar to those found strategically placed throughout the cabins. These grave goods represent traditions from the various ethnic groups represented by the slave population at Kingsley Plantation. We need to know much more about that burial ground, and we no doubt will. But this we do know, that the sheer discovery of it helps us to begin hopefully, to use what is there in the ground, to use that reality, to use what was probably the expression of lives so difficultly lived. Let us use all of that to begin to heal the deep divisions that even today reflect those horrific divisions constructed during enslavement in America. And it gives us all the opportunity to acknowledge these people, to recognize their contribution to the creation of that landscape, and it gives the descendant community both the larger African-American community of this country who visit that park, and also the lineal descendants. Those people actually are related to these people, and the ability to pay their respects. We are being provided with an opportunity to connect in a deeper and more meaningful way with specific individuals who were once so tied to the earth in this place we now call Kingsley Plantation. May knowledge about this burial ground come forth to help us better understand the universal cry for freedom. Good evening. Tonight is about values. We're here to listen to you. We want to understand what you value. Civic engagement is a new process to us at the Timaquan Preserve. It's not a new process in our community. We've had study circles for quite some time. But for the federal government and for the National Park Service, we view this as an opportunity to build on those circles, to build a new understanding. Not that we come and tell you what we're going to do 
and ask how you like it, but that we ask you how you feel about what we've learned. And then we'll develop options together. Discovery of a cemetery, depending on your background, depending on your upbringing, depending on your education, means different things. At some point, we will all come together with an idea of what it means to honor lives that were lived there and the people who died there. We're looking to our community to help us understand what this discovery really means. As a biologist, I'm excited. As a steward of National Park Resources, it's an amazing thing. As a person of African descent, there are no words, but I think you have words. As far as we know, the only time in the National Park Service history, certainly current history, where the first step in the process has, has been to let's slow down and find out what the community thinks about these. What are the values that the community holds dear? And what kind of, what can come out of this that would be um, additive rather than reacting to, to something that uh, would lead to a different kind of conclusion. And so we have worked with the, with the staff. We've had workshops, two-day workshops with the staff along the way. We've had three of them. All of the staff has been involved in those. To, to slow down and reflect a bit on what this issue of uh, this discovery means at a personal level and, and the heavy responsibility that comes with protecting and, and, and creating appropriate access. And so this is a community in dialogue is the way we're framing it. It's a discovery process. This is our belief, Shirley's in mind, that we present every time we work with a group that all meaningful and lasting change begins on the inside. So you'll have an opportunity in a moment to reflect a bit internally on what this issue of of death and dying and burial and discovery means to you and what then it might mean to this community. We're going to be asking you to do some sharing this evening in just a minute and uh, part of that sharing is one person speaking at a time with everyone else listening and we'd like you to listen actively. If we listen with our hearts sometimes the words and the motions uh, take on a whole different meaning. But what we're hoping for this evening is that we can look back in our own lives and think about what's important to us, what we value, and how remembering that helps us to move forward. And so that's the sort of spirit of this, of coming together in unusual ways, in a rare opportunity to create something new. So the first question we want you to reflect on and to talk about Go around and, and, uh, and share your name and community affiliation, and then in a word or a phrase, describe how you feel about being here this evening. It's what sort of set the tone. If you, if you go inside and sort of tap into your own emotional state right now, where are you? What feelings are coming up? Just a word or a phrase. My name is Stephen Davis. I'm a local landscape architect here in Jacksonville. Been here about 14 years. And the two words that come to mind as far as being here tonight are surprise and gratefulness. I didn't really know that any of this was going to be happening. I thought it was more of a kind of an open house. But um, I'm just, I, that's most I can say. I'm just surprised and grateful to be here. I think in the community I came from, uh, we hold cemeteries or graveyards with our highest respect. And it goes from the death to the ground and beyond. The announcement of the discovery was just amazing. So I'm here to learn more about that as well. When the person is alive, we love them and we, we exhort them. And when they, they die, we feel, where I came from, that we need to still connect with them. And so we do that in memories. I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. And um, a couple of the groups have, have finished this first process. And so I want to put up the second question. And uh, those of you who haven't finished the first question, finish it and then go on to the second. So it'll be up here.
This is an opportunity to reflect back on what this issue of burial and death and dying means. So, because in thinking about how to honor uh, those buried at Kingsley, it's really important to have a sense of the depth of what we're about. So we want you to think back to a time when a significant person in your life passed away. Briefly, describe what happened. Um, where were you? How old were you? What part of the country? And importantly, how you felt. But we want to open up an opportunity for that here so that this community begins to get a sense of the differences and values that may exist in, in life experiences and, and feels comfortable in that conversation. So that as the Park Service listens, it hears the depth of what's involved in protecting and providing access for and doing the research around this discovery. Um, well, I actually go to the cemetery every Sunday um, since he died, and I take fresh flowers to um, his crypt. So for me, it's, um, it's difficult because I question whether or not that is something that I should continue to do. And as I looked at your face by saying that, your eyebrows raised. Um, so certainly there's a group that says you need to move on, you need to stop doing that. Um, and there's a part of me that says, okay, every Sunday I would go over and get his medication ready for the week to come. So now I'm going every Sunday to the cemetery to, uh, to take flowers. What were your feelings at the time? Well, I think my, when my mother uh, passed, my father was more recent. Uh, when my mother passed, I was an adult with a family. And I really didn't look at her as passing uh, because of my religious belief. I looked at her as living because, as I stated earlier, I knew that the values that she put into me would continue to live because I made it my business for myself to continue them. I've, you know, when it comes to death, I'm not too emotional with that because I accept it as completing the circle of life. Just as my uncle died, a child was being born. Um, so I was, I've been able to accept that. Um, how I honor him is um, definitely being the best me that I could possibly be. And um, to know when I'm not living up to my potential, I could hear in my ear his voice and his spirit saying, get it together, suck it up, not in such nice terms, um, because my uncle was the first person who um, made me a leader, so to speak. And I mean, he made me a leader by making me the quarterback of the football team. And I've um, carried some of his stuff with me that nobody can talk to me the way that he used to talk to me. Ever in life. When he got sick with cancer, the first time, and this is before they had much in the way of cancer treatment, no chemotherapy or anything like that. They'd done surgery on his colon, they put him, they just tied him, you know, put him back together and said, you have a year to live. And, but they didn't tell him that. They only told my mother that, and she told us, and we were sworn not to tell him what he had. And so he went ahead for the next nine months, okay, until the final, time of getting really, really sick with the cancer back and the doctor unable to do anything. He's lying in the bed at home in excruciating pain. They don't have much in the way of painkillers. You know, we would stay up, take turns staying up at night to be with him, but we couldn't tell him what was wrong. This was agonizing to my mother. I know it when she was non, an undemonstrative sort of person. And finally, they took him away to the hospital to die. And um, we didn't have, we lived with his dying, but not with his death. And there, it was cremated, there's a memorial service, and I have no memory of the memorial service of what happened afterwards. So how does all of this secrecy in oh, Facebook? <laughs> but yeah, but I have actually two brooches of my grandmother's, and every now and then when I'm feeling like I just need to be lifted up, I will wear them. And people say, oh, that's really pretty. It's, it's, it's kind of antique. And I forget, it's very antique. <laughs> but um, I, it, just, it just reminds me of how much she loved people and she just was so embracing of people and loved to celebrate everything about life. She was just full of love, full of life. Uh, I remember them because 
he was the one who probably turned me into a social justice person because he'd gotten involved with the African American community in 1950-51. This is before Brown and, and Montgomery. Uh, the house was being, the apartment complex was going to be destroyed by the owner to make, build something to make more money. And the occupants were all African American. And he and a half a dozen others put together a nonprofit corporation and raised the money to buy the apartment complex. And then, sold it to the residents over a period of time. That is, by their paying their rent, they bought the apartment complex. So I think what I hear you saying is We celebrated all of my mother, my grandmother, my father, my sister. And when her kids, because I don't have any, when her kids come to town, we go to the cemetery as part of our weekend activity. We clean, clean the grave. We put fresh flowers out. I had a bench purposely put out there when my grandmother died, who was the first in the series, so that I could go and sit and talk with her and just be there. Um, and I go and I clean that off. And Now, my father's not buried where they are, but I go to his site, clean it, put flowers down. As I did Christmas, no one came home Christmas. So I had that task of doing by myself. But when my sister's kids come to town, they may not come to my house first if they're driving. Or if they're there at some point, if we haven't been as a group or they haven't been for a while, we go and we'll just sit and be sure that they're fresh flowers, that they're, I mean, that everything's clean, that everything is, is okay, so. We had watched a movie and I had asked her um, how she would feel if she was ever in a situation where she was in a coma and she told me don't you ever let anybody pull a plug on me because you never know about a miracle and so there I was again with me against my aunts and my brother and saying that you know mama didn't want that and because I took care of her they allowed me to make the decision the the night that she did pass I had gone to that hospital every day for four months, and when I, but this particular night, I, I was tired, I was leaving work, and I just did, I said, I'll stop, I'll come back in the morning. But when I got home, they were calling me to say that she, that she had passed, or she was passing, and so of course I had to go back. And um, I didn't know what to do, but as it turned out, the person who came to care for her, to take, to take her body away, was someone that I had grown up with. So there was almost a sense of comfort there. And um, while I had been told that, uh, you know, about her quality of life, when she was ready to go, as though I was being told that you should just let her go, when she was ready to go, even though she was on what I recognize now as being life support, she, she is when she left. So again, that, that, that part, what it, what it did told me was that you have to follow your own you're, you have to follow what you have to follow and, and spirit will take, will do what it's supposed to do. And every day I know that my mother and her siblings, my Aunt Edna, my Aunt Frances, I know all of them are, are watching over me and it's what I believe. parks or state parks or these uh, plantation sites that are preserved or maintained. Um, the slave cemetery is lost and forgotten. They just don't know where they are. Uh, or they say not memorialized, they're not uh, part of the public tour. Uh, and because the cemetery is so public, uh, it's right there on the road. Uh, it gives the uh, Park Service another opportunity to memorialize them. Um, and of course, I mean, the minute we found them, I thought, you know, a fence and some signage would be the minimum you would do. Uh, the problem is right now we don't know the extent of it. And so we don't want a fence. This is a big problem with cemeteries is once they put a fence around the cemetery, you, pre you assume that it contains it. And in fact, it does not contain it. We don't know the extent. I mean, it could be an acre or two. When you, you were talking about the cabins, I, I agree. I, I think the cabins are the essence of Kingsley Plantation. You yeah. do really have a sense of people who lived there before, but you want to know who they were. If there were a way to know their names, if there were a way to know something about them, right. and as you stand there, you just, somebody was here, and it, it does give you a sense of 
an era and a time in our history, slavery and so on, but it's that personal connection that I think is, 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 is lacking there. Now what was really amazing to me about this is they were three nuns oh. and I'm an atheist. Okay. And I taught with them at, at the only women's college in Canada for 20 years prior to this, this event. What those women meant to me and how much we cha exchanged our ideas and changed over time because of exposure to me as an atheist and okay. them as dedicated Ro <laughs> Roman Catholics. Yes. Lucky we did this question. <laughs> Go ahead. It, it wasn't, those women remain in my heart. That's where I honor them and where they affect me every single day of my life. Okay, so can I ask you say one thing? Yeah. You ever say you're an atheist? Because you know what? You do believe. <laughs> well, they used to tell me that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 You know, but they used to tell me that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if I can have your attention up here for just a moment. Uh, I'm aware of the tone in the room and the feeling in the room. And uh, how about everybody take a deep breath? One of the things that we know abstractly about this material is that when we open the question, we're moving into sacred territory. And my image as I stood here listening to some of you and observing was that I will bet that if we had asked this question in the 1800s or 1700s of people who were slaves on plantations, the conversation wouldn't have been a heck of a lot different. So there's a way in which this conversation about something as difficult as death and dying and burial and, and, and honoring can bring a community together. If that can't bring a community together, what can? Because that is the final act of inclusion, isn't it? We all go there. So what I'd like you to do now is to buzz around the table and produce a word or a phrase that describes the emotional tone that, of, this, of your group for the last half hour. 30 seconds, figure it out, a word or a phrase, and I'm gonna ask the facilitator to 30 seconds to stand and simply say the word or phrase that your table group came up with. What word or phrase captures the emotion or the emotional state or tone of your group in this discussion? Reflective pride blessed. Reflective pride blessed. Pride and blessed. Reflective and anger. Reflective and anger. Uh, reverence. Reverence. Remembering. Honoring for they never die. So what begins to bubble up when a community engages around this issue is a spirit that embraces the environment that is uh, reflective, that is remembering. And by the way, that's an interesting word because if you think about remembering, it remembering, that means to put something back together, to re member, right? Reflective, proud, blessed, and honoring. Isn't it interesting we begin to talk about something as difficult as this issue? Even given all the cultural differences, the spirit that rises up out of that conversation can be characterized in those ways. So we have a next question we want to ask and a different kind of structure to use. And we really appreciate your working with this process because to go down into these issues and then to be asked to come back up out of them. And, and I walked around, there was some emotion, deep emotion around the room. And so I really appreciate your working with this. Um, this is the beginning of a process and we're learning as we go through, by the way, as we move out into the community, this will be informative for us. What we want to do now is to create an opportunity for what we call a park bench conversation. 
Park bench is a structure that's used commonly in group dynamics and group process. And the spirit of the park bench is that you're walking to Central Park or some park and you sit on a bench and somebody else comes and sits beside you and somebody else and you begin to have a conversation just chatting. So we want to uh, each table group to take another 30 seconds and identify a person who you want to come and sit on the park bench, one from each table. So it would be five people up here. And it can be the person that has a strong story or a person who, whatever, you use your own criteria. But just identify a person whose story you'd, you'd like to have be part of the collective conversation. And uh, so you've been listening in to conversation. You've been participating in a conversation um, about a really interesting subject um, in the context of the burial dis rediscovery, in the context of uh, a, a, an effort to engage the community in some conversation around this issue, knowing that um, the conversations at many of the tables were very personal. Um, and so we have a question we want to ask you, which is, let's say that somebody from that era, from the Kingsley era, were alive today. What would you want to believe that person would be saying to us here? And I want you to connect that to your own story. So if you would say, just say the, the name of the context of the story that you told. For example, for me, it would be my, my son Kahari died when he was 33. And so I have a particular feeling about this issue, uh, my own life experience coming out of that. So if I then make a leap and I'm uh, trying to figure out what a person who was a slave must have felt and what he or she would be saying today, Here's the message that I think that they would be bringing forward to this community and to the park service. So two steps, who was it in your, in your story? And, and as you take that into account, what would the message be that would be truly honoring of the life and death of both your own relative or friend and the slaves? How about it? to my park benchers, uh, I think that uh, reflecting to the plantation and the people on the plantation, uh, I look back to my parents and relatives as far as I can see right now, uh, because it was a very progressive uh, plantation with a black wife and a white uh, husband in that era. And so I can see both of them looking at my wife, especially, and myself, who was used into the breaking of this country uh, to be first to go into black schools or whatever. And I can see them, wherever they were in, on the plantation, or my mother in her home, or, or relatives saying, this is what I prayed about. This is what I wanted for me and this is what you got this is a question that I often think about all the time because I had no part into it why was I used and I think the reason I was using my wife in this situation is because they prayed for it they wished for it for themselves and I can see them on Kingsley Plantation right now the slaves saying okay take our place, and I accept the challenge. Thank you very much. How about someone else? Um, in my discussion with my group, um, I talked about my uncle Henry Brown. And um, if he were alive today and even in death, 
he would say to me and he says to me, the expectation is still the same. Whether I'm living or I'm physically deceased, the expectation is still the same. And that is, I expect excellence at all times and I expect you to serve other people. That's what my uncle would say. And if the, if I had to reflect upon the people who in particular were slaves on the Kingsley plantation, you know, I would have to say in my, in, in my spirit is saying that they would ask the question, is this it? Did we die for this? And that is that when we look at our country and we look at ourselves, we are about as polarized as we could ever be. And if you, you don't believe that, all you had to do was turn on your TV last week. And they would say, man, we died. We did all of this stuff. We went through all of that. And yet you all are still committing and doing the same things that we went through. So the more things have changed, in a sense, the spirit of them says the more things have stayed the same. And so they would be asking themselves, what have you all collectively learned? We died so that you could be free. We died so that you could have integrated schools. Yet and still, poverty is still astronomical. Still, you have disparities that are just absolutely off the chart. And so they would, they would, you know, they would say to me, to say to you, and say to all of us, what have you learned? And if you truly learned, what are you prepared or at the very least doing about it? Thank you. When I think of somebody that meant a lot to me was my grandmother and she actually ran a town in historical on Old Route 66. And when she passed, or before she passed, we sold it for history, for preservation, to restore it because history is important. So when I think of the slave quarters or Kingsley or any of our national parks or any of the areas that we work to preserve, it's a world of history. The moment the second has passed, it has become history. And when we can capture and explore and find out the history of anything, we are learning about ourselves, we are learning about our parents, our grandparents, and that we will become a part of history tomorrow. And I hope that we do a better job of recording our history than some of the history that has been lost to us. And as we find treasures like Kingsley's slave quarters and the, and the cemetery, that we take the time to do it right and find a way to respect that history and share it well with everybody else. Thank you. Um, I think that I should mention before I go into this that I'm actually one of the uh, archaeologists working on this project. So <laughs> I have slightly an insider's view, I suppose, of that aspect of the next step. And uh, when I talked at the table, I talked about my grandfather, who I really only got to know uh, the last two years of his life. And... Um, he went through a lot of rough times in his life, but still managed to keep that uh, that joy and that zest for, for life. And he was always focusing on the happy bits and, and didn't dwell on the bad ones. And um, I actually, when I'm at the plantation and I'm digging there and I'm reading about the cultures from which these people came, it's, I get a very much a sense of that same idea of not necessarily whitewashing the bad things so much as their farm the story is far more complex and the people that lived there had individual lives as much as they did a you know a one that everyone knows mm -hmm. and uh, so I suppose the way to honor them is to remember them the way that they're African heritage does and know that the people may be dead, the body may be dead, but the person's essence still survives and continues to stay with their family and the people that we've 
found where they've been buried, they're still there at Kingsley. Their essence is still there some somehow, and um, we need to really just acknowledge their continued presence. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I have to stand, because I'm a descendant. Um, we never forgotten the ones that passed on, because we had stories that taken us from day to day to, to now. I have a sister that never, she is navigator, that's what we call her. Uh, Deborah navigate through things tonight, I was here because she navigated me to being here. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm standing up as a king because uh, as any of my ancestors passed, we didn't ever look at, and I'm gonna be bottom line, point blank, never looked at ourselves as being slaves. All right, all my family descendants across the bridge from that water from St. John all the way to the ocean. It is traits. There are stories. It, we've been navigated to never forget. I could tell you things about how myself was programmed, was made into a man, not just I'm talking about I went through stages of baby, young little boy, played in the sand and dirts, played marbles, learned how to be a man, a young man, to also go in to defend my country. I'm a Vietnam combat soldier, one of the ones that made bag, that my uncles them conversated and told me one thing. Number one is to pray. Every man is going to cry when you feel death close to you. But then you start thinking back to the things that they taught you. I would tell you, well, you never forget. You always have them in memory. So the love that you have in here, you can't throw this out. I don't care what you can lose in here. You can't never leave this because this is going to guide you. So by being a descendant, and like I told them all at the table, you don't want me right up there because I can talk for hours. I has been programmed, and I love the stories that I was brought up with. They was like, we would lay back and look at the stars. My father was in the Navy. He would navigate us. I mean, in certain stars, he would give us names. You know, like Leo is there. That would be Louis. When you see the Capricorn or the Milky Way, that would be my sister Deborah because she loved to carry things on. So things that we was navigated through, we never looked at it, nothing but a person of different color. You treated a man as so he was. You treated a man just so he carried yourself. Do unto others as you have them to do unto you. So I was very religious. My family is very holiness. We are sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, they say. So therefore, we went through a guiding which today, I'm 63 years old and I'm loving it that I had that opportunity to be a part of a family that did this. I can take you places now that the same material that we see in Kingston Plantation, the way that all of these cabins was made. I can take you to a place where steps, the house is gone, the steps are still standing. So it gives me an honor to see all of y'all thinking about my family. Oh. So stay with that. Yeah. So just do this for us. In just a word, what do you, what's that emotion? What are you feeling? Honor. Honor. Greatness. And so it goes deep. Yes, very deep. Okay, so the teaching here, there's a lot of teachers. Everybody is a teacher up here, right? And thank you for being up here. Yes. Thank you. Um, because it is, uh, it's, it's an honor that runs both ways. Yes. You're feeling honored, and I'm sure there isn't a place, a person in the room who isn't feeling honored by your uh, opening yourself up to yourself and to these folks and to this community in here. And, and, and we have created a closed, divided community. And is this a way to open it up? Yes. Perhaps. Because if we can't talk about this, and, and share in the emotion, 
what is it that we can possibly talk about that will bring us together? Um, so, Rodell, if you wouldn't mind, um, I know there's more, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's four other folks up here who have more. And there's about 40 or 50 of you out there who have more. And there's always more. And that's a good thing. Because that means the journey doesn't end. In fact, uh, Rodell is suggesting that the journey doesn't end at death, that maybe there's a way we all come together. So a temperature check is literally a word or a phrase that describes how you're feeling right now. And we want every voice in. And so we'll start with this table over here, and the mic will go around. And so go inside again, and in a word or a phrase, capture how you're feeling right now. Whatever comes to mind, whatever is at top of mind, that's perfect. So a word or a phrase. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Great. Thank you, Willa. I feel released. Thank you. I feel excited. I feel encouraged. I feel concerned. I feel anxious. Thank you. This table. I feel grateful. I feel frustrated. Intrigued. Uh, I feel serious. Interested. I am on it. Doubtful. Hopeful. I feel guided. Touched. Um, encouraged. I feel grateful. I feel positive. I feel hopeful. I feel reflective. For beginning. I feel guided. Bewildered. I feel positive. I feel touched. I'm astounded. I feel honored as well. I feel intrigued. I feel grateful. I feel honored. Disappointed. I think just the bits that I heard tonight were so profound and I am deeply touched. And I thank you all for sharing in the way that you did. I want to thank each and every one of you and ask you to please continue to help us on this journey as we move forward to honoring those that we've lost. It's our our call to action, and we hope that you will share in that. Thank you, and have a good night.
I, like you, Kit has been here about 23 years, and I would take my daughter, and I remember the times when you could actually go in and see the different rooms at the Kingsley, and I look forward to the day that some of that opens back up for all of us to be able to enjoy again. Yes, I've been through that house many a day, <laughs> many a time. And I, and I was just here recently, and I'm surprised, you know, and I would love to see it restored to a better condition so that all of us can enjoy it better. All we need is a little bit of money. Absolutely. You, you know what, though? To me, that's not where the story is. Okay. To me, the kitchen house where the slaves cooked the, the meals, and, and you can see just the, the, the work that they did there for other people. And, and you, you know, the, the fireplace is there, the wrought iron, and you can see where it's worn down, where the slaves toiled. And to me, that's where the story is, not the, the, the planter's house, because that was, that was the castle, that was the, the ivory tower. That's, that's not the story to me, Kingsley. To me, the story is, is the slaves' toil and, 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 the, and the culture that they brought to, to America that we all have today that's part of us, it's part of our fabric, is what the, what the slaves brought over. It, it's part of what makes us today, all of us today.